Well, hello everybody and welcome to Live with Lon this week. We're so glad that you're with us. Um, we're going to pray and we have just a sweet passage of scripture that we're going to exegete and exposit and study today. Remember, we're doing the Gospels and we're doing a deep study of the Gospels. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. But just before we pray, let me just tell you that I heard this week uh, from Joel Rosenberg. Uh, many of you know Joel. He's written, you know, New York Times bestseller books about the end times. Uh, now he now lives in Israel. Uh, but uh, he used to come to McLean Bible Church and we were buddies there. And he just uh, has gotten back to me and told me that he uh, has agreed to come and be with us on our Israel tour in April. He's going to come one evening, have dinner with us at the hotel in Jerusalem, have a presentation, have a question and answer time. Yeah, he'll sign a book if you bring one of his books. Um, he's a wonderful guy, and uh, he's done this for us a couple of times. He wasn't going to be able to do it in October when we were originally scheduled. He had a schedule conflict, but he can do it in April. So, I hope you'll join us for that and get a chance to meet Joel Rosenberg. Just go to our website, lonsolomonministries.com, and uh, you find all the information there. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us life this past week. Lord, we know the Bible says that you have life in yourself and you give it to whomever you wish. And so remind us, Lord, that we were not alive this past week because our heart was beating or our brain was working. We were alive because the living Lord Jesus Christ decided to give life to each of us. So, Lord, help us come to you as grateful people today. Help us come to you, Lord, today with all of the burdens of our heart and the struggles of our soul and transfer them to you this morning. Let's take a moment and do that. Lord, and help us leave these things at the foot of the cross. Help us nail them to the cross and throw away the crowbar so we can't pry them off, Lord, so you can carry our burdens for us. Now, Father, we pray against this virus again, and we will continue to do that because, Lord, I believe that uh, you will answer that prayer and give us a vaccine and give us uh, treatment plans. And, Lord, we ask for your mercy for in this regard for the human race. We ask for your mercy for our own family that we uh, don't contract this virus. Lord, bring this time of isolation and uh, pandemic and quarantine to an end and allow us, Lord, to get back to some of the joys of life that we've had to sacrifice uh, because of this virus. God, we beseech you for your mercy. And now we commit our time in the word of God to you. Use it, Lord, to challenge and encourage our hearts today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Well, we are uh, in, uh, we're using, of course, the uh, New King James uh, translation of the Bible, and we're in uh, the Gospels, as we said, and today we're in Luke chapter 7. Now, this has been an exciting chapter. In this chapter, uh, Jesus has healed the centurion servant. In this chapter we saw last week, Jesus raised back to life uh, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler uh, there in Capernaum. And now we have another wonderful passage uh, here in Luke 7, verse 36. Here we go. And one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask 
of fragrant oil. Now, when the Bible says she was a sinner, uh, the Bible in a nice way is trying to tell us she was a prostitute. And she heard Jesus was at this Pharisee's house, and she went and burst in, and look what she did. And she stood at Jesus' feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, and anointed them with this fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited Jesus, saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, <clears throat> would have known who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, uh, the sad thing about this poor man, Simon, uh, and we're going to learn his name in a minute, the Pharisee, is that he was able to say, she is a sinner, but he was not able to say, I am a sinner. You understand what I'm saying? He was e easily able to accuse her of the sins of the flesh, and he understood that perfectly. But he didn't understand that he may not have had those sins of the flesh, but he had sins of the spirit, jealousy, unforgiveness, greed, uh, uh, arrogance, self-righteousness, uh, judgmentalness. I mean, these sins are even more evil uh, to our spirit sometimes than the sins of the flesh. Uh, and he had them all. The Pharisees had them all. We all have them all. But he was not able to see that about himself. She is a sinner. Not me. Not me. And this attitude... Uh, on Simon's part, bothered Jesus so much that he tells a little story, a little parable there at dinner. Look, here we go. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, now this is not Simon Peter, this is Simon the Pharisee, the host of this dinner. I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher, say it. So Jesus said there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, about well, $160,000 in our money today. The other owed 50, about $16,000. Uh, and when they both had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, he says to Simon, therefore, which of them will love the creditor more. And Simon answered and said, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. Now, this story, we need to identify the characters in this story. Who is the creditor that these men owed the money to? Well, of course, that's Almighty God. And who are the two creditors in this story? Well, the one that owed $160,000 was the prostitute. Uh, the one that owed uh, only uh, um, uh, $16,000 was Simon. Now, the truth is, Simon owed just as much debt in terms of sin uh, to the Lord as the woman did. He just didn't believe that he did. That, that, that's the difference. And Jesus makes the point. What's the point of the parable? The point is, the more a person realizes how big a sin debt they owe Almighty God, and how utterly incapable they are of paying it, the more they love God when he forgives them graciously and freely. Do we understand that? And Jesus goes on to make this point. Watch. He said, you have judged rightly, verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, 
but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, Simon, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, Jesus' point here is that the woman's behavior was completely normal and completely expected because she understood the depth of her sinfulness. She understood how much Jesus had forgiven her freely when she could never pay her sin debt to God. And the truth of the matter is, Simon had just as much sin debt as we said. He just didn't understand it. Now, friends, before we go on to ask the, our most important question, I just want to say one quick thing. And that is, there is a principle here we see, a very important principle about how God does business with human beings, about how God forgives, on what basis he forgives us as human beings and shows mercy to us as human beings and, and, and shows compassion to us and answers our prayers. Uh, there's a formula here. And the formula very simply is this. The formula is, I have the need and God has the supply. <clears throat> That's it. I have the need God has the supply. Now, some people mess this formula up on the first part. I have the need. They will say, I don't have a need. I'm fine. Often when I'm out on the street passing out tracts, uh, which I did often with Jews for Jesus, I would try to hand uh, these tracts to people, uh, both here in Washington, D.C. I've done it, in New York City, elsewhere. And you know... One of the most common things people will say when you try to give them a track or talk to them about the Lord is, I'm fine. I'm good. I don't need, I don't need that. Uh, I'm fine. Well, no, they're not fine. Uh, they, they have, even if they don't have great sins of the flesh, they have great sins of the spirit. We all do. And so they mess the formula up because they don't believe they have a need. Others of us mess the formula up on the second part. God has the supply. We might say, oh, okay, I have the need. I have sin in my life, but I can fix this myself. I can solve this myself. I can work my way to heaven myself. Or even uh, Christians, sometimes we mess this formula up. I have the need for this, that, or the other thing in my Christian life, but I don't need to go to God and ask for the supply. I can work this out, figure this out, gut this out, Myself, friends, God only deals with people, whether you're an unbelieving person wanting to be saved or whether you're a believer wanting something that God uh, can supply. God only works when we keep both ends of the formula. I have the need and I come humbly to God to ask for the supply whether the supply is forgiveness of sins or whether it is some issue in our Christian lives, he has the supply. We don't try to work it out. And if you're out there and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, let me just say, you have the need, my friend, and God has the supply. And if you'll come to him humbly and just confess your sin and ask him to save you and forgive you and give you eternal life, He'll do it. Eternal life is a gift that he gives to people who keep the formula. And friends, as followers of Jesus, 
don't ever try to gut something out. I do this all the time. I, you know, I got a need and I just kind of go, charge in me. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to solve it. And then after I'm completely frustrated and I failed, I go, ooh, yeah, Lord, I should have come to you at the very beginning and said, Lord Jesus, can you please help me with this? Lord Jesus, can you please meet this need? And friends, this is the formula and it works for Christians and non-Christians. We have the need, God has the supply. Now, we need to ask our most important question. And you know what this is, so are you ready? Let's go now, come on. One, two, three, let me hear it. So what? <laughs> yeah, baby, yeah. So what? I heard you, sort of, through the screen, how sweet it is. You say, Lon, this is a great passage of scripture, but what does it have to do with me? Uh, well, I want to tell you about what it has to do with you. My friends, this woman who was here, I want you to realize who this woman was. Now, we turn <clears throat> in John chapter to John chapter 11 in the New Testament. Listen to this. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now look at verse 2. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. You say, are you kidding me? Mary and Martha? You know, Mary sat at his feet listening to him teach the word. Martha ran around and he goes, Martha, 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 you're concerned about so many things, but only one thing's necessary. Yeah, that Mary. Mary, the brother of Lazarus, who God, uh, that Jesus raised from the dead after four days. Yep, yeah, that Mary. That's who this woman was, that Mary. And look, knowing that is fabulous because look at the life change that came into her life. She was a prostitute, and she ended up loving the Word of God, sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha ran all around doing stuff. She was certainly one of the women that the Bible tells us uh, ministered to Jesus during his earthly ministry and were there at the cross with him. And church tradition tells us that after uh, Jesus rose from the dead and went back to heaven, Mary, along with her brother moved to the island of Cyprus and became missionaries in Cyprus and all around the Mediterranean world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, from a prostitute to a missionary, you talk about a life change, this is what Jesus did for this woman. And folks, this is what Jesus does for every one of us who truly come to Christ. He, he works inside of us. Uh, like yeast inside of dough, Jesus said. And from the inside out, he transforms us into new creatures, into people that we hardly even recognize years later, into people that we never thought we could become, into people that God uses in ways that we never dreamed we, we could be used. This is why uh, the verse, I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Listen to this wonderful verse. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, anyone, he or she is a new creation from the inside out. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, we don't become perfect, no, no, but I love with a guy who said, hey, I may not be everything I want to be for Christ, but I sure am better than I used to be for Christ, and that's the truth. And just think of how many people Jesus did this for. Think of uh, John uh, Newton, uh, the, uh, you know, he was a profane, debauched slave, trader, and merchant. And, and God changed his life and made him a new creature, a pastor, a hymn writer, amazing grace. Yeah, he wrote that. 
and an ardent abolitionist that helped wipe slavery out of the British Empire. Uh, think of Fanny Crosby, this uh, handicapped, blind uh, little girl uh, who had no real future uh, in that time. There was no, you know, ADA. There was no uh, great sensitivity for people with handicaps. And yet God took her life made her a new creature, and she went on to be the greatest American hymn writer and probably one of the greatest hymn writers of all time in the entire world. Uh, think of Chuck Colson. He was the hatchet man for President Nixon, and people uh, uh, people were, were scared of him. He was a rough, a mean guy. And yet when God took him, he made him into a brand new teacher. He started prison fellowship and no telling how many people who have been in federal penitentiaries are going to be in heaven because of prison fellowship and the change in Chuck Colson's life. And how about Lon Solomon, huh? I was a, a drug dealing, lying, cheating, stealing, profane, womanizing, drinking, gambling, a uh, sociopathical person, uh, forcing my girlfriend to have an abortion. Uh, I was a horrible person. Horrible. You know, I told Brenda, I, want, I know what I want on my gravestone. I'll put it up on the screen. Here's what I want on my gravestone. A less than ordinary man with a more than extraordinary God. Now, don't you steal that and put it on your stone. That's mine. <laughs> you can have it. I don't care. If that's true of you, a, a less than ordinary man with a more than extraordinary God. And I, we were with our small group. Uh, we were all sitting six feet apart. Yeah, okay. The other night, and I said I wanted this on my tombstone. And one of the people in the group said, Lon, that no, you weren't less than ordinary. You were just ordinary. <clears throat> Don't put yourself down like that. And I said, hey, I love you, but you didn't know me. I, I was a less than ordinary person. I was the most profane, debauched human being you have ever seen in your life <clears throat> before Jesus Christ came into my life. I was less than ordinary. And I said, please let me pass my own judgment on my, on my spiritual condition. Uh, please. Uh, uh, I was less than ordinary. And look what God's done with my life. It wasn't me. This is what Jesus, could I have ever believed where God has taken me and what he's done with my life? Never, never, never. When I went back to my 50th high school reunion a couple years ago, People were like shocked. I mean, a lot of them had heard what God had done in my life. But when my old chemistry teacher, who's still living, Mrs. Hinton, uh, heard uh, what, how God had used me, I mean, all she said, at least this is what I was told, was uh, that's a strange thing for him. He was. Yeah. This is the kind of change God brings, and it's the kind of change he brought to Mary. There's a wonderful poem, and I hope many of you can give that same testimony. Uh, the, the, there's a great poem, one of my favorite. We'll put it up on the screen. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. Follow along. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while. To waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, only two. Two dollars and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the back of the room. A gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening all of the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet 
as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. And the people cheered. But some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. And the man replied, "'Twas the touch of the master's hand. And many a person with life out of tune, who's been battered and torn by sin, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like this old violin. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. You know, I always tear up when I read that poem because I'm a living, breathing example of the touch of the master's hand. I was that old violin, just like many of you were. And boy, did the touch of the master's hand change everything. And folks, I want to challenge you when we look at people, not to see them the way Rabbi Simon saw them. He had this woman stuck in a little box called prostitute, and that's all he could see. But Jesus saw what she could become outside of that box for Christ. If she only had the touch of the master's hand, if she only gave Christ her life, if she only became a new creature in Christ, what Mary could become. And I hope that you and I will always see people like that, no matter where they are or what they are. Let's not put them in the box and say that's what they are, but let's see them in terms of what they can become for the Lord Jesus. And let's share the gospel with them. Share the gospel with them. I don't care how hopeless it looks. I don't care how profane they may be. Share the gospel with them. Because if they come to Christ, Jesus is not going to leave them the way he finds them. He didn't leave Mary that way, John Newton that way, Fanny Crosby that way, Chuck Colson that way, Lon Solomon that way, and he's not going to leave anyone that way. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word today. Use it in our hearts and lives to increase our love for you, Lord. Give us the courage to let you show us what really lives inside of us, Lord Jesus. Not that we might be depressed, but that so we might be impressed with the love, the mercy, and the compassion of the Lord Jesus all the more and fall in love with you all the more. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, listen, thanks for being with us. You know, here at Live, uh, with, Live, uh, Live with Lon, we only do one thing. We teach the Bible. I love Billy Graham used to always say, the Bible says, the Bible says. I borrowed that from him years ago in, in, in my sermons. The Bible says, because friends, that's the only thing that matters. Uh, what people say, uh, that is not authoritative for our life. Uh, what, what movements say, that's not authoritative in our life. What some college professor says or some book says, the, the authority in our life is the Word of God. What we care about is the Bible says. And that's what Live with Lon is all about. It's the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Word of God. That's what we're about. 
and it's what my ministry has been about to the best of my ability for 45 years. So tune in and join us, tell your friends, and we will give you to the best of our ability what the Bible says. God bless you. Have a week in which you love the Lord. Take care.